Guys, wouldn't your wife or girlfriend love it if you treated her to the very best this Christmas? Now you can, with the world's softest pajamas by Pajamagram. Created by a team of pajama experts, the world's softest PJs are lighter than a cloud, softer than a bunny, like cashmere, only better. She'll love how heavenly they feel. Includes free gift packaging and Christmas delivery is guaranteed. So visit pajamagram.com or call 1 800 Give PJs. Welcome to the Right Time Podcast. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. All right, Eagles fans, I, I have to be honest here. I've spent a significant portion of this season saying that I wondered what the thing was that was going to happen that was going to bring your season all crashing down, right? I kind of joked about that because you guys have probably had a bit of a fatalistic assumption about the way the season was going to go. But I wasn't wishing a Carson Wentz ACL tear upon anyone. And that's what we wound up with. Uh, Carson Wentz has a torn ACL. He is out for the season. The Eagles are going to go to Nick Foles from here on out. Now, let's start with the fact that that was a hell of a football game that we had between the Eagles and the Rams. I don't think there was any way that any of us believe when the season started that you'd wind up with a legitimately pivotal matchup between the Eagles and the Rams that would have serious consequences for postseason seeding and the rest. That's what we wound up with. And with the Eagles, I think part of what makes this loss, at least it would for me if I was an Eagles fan, particularly frustrating, is I felt like this was a win against the Rams that was really unlike any that they'd had earlier this year. I think the best win they'd had this season prior was against the Panthers, but it was against the Panthers. It was on Thursday night, and I think we all know that Thursday night games, you can only glean but so much of those. Now, you don't knock the Eagles for the fact that when they put a bad team in front of them, they went out there and beat the bad team. There's no way in the world that you can blame them for that fact. But this was a win that was like, oh, okay, they're here. Right, They are here. You saw that quarterback, the way that roster looked against another really good team. I was in early on the Rams, by the way. I can, I can claim a little credit on that. Shannon, remember when I was telling people the Rams, the Rams probably going to be good. you remember that? Oh, really? Oh, you're, okay. You're, you remember I'm what sure I was I can that. find that somewhere in the uh, archives. Oh, oh, I'm just saying. You, I, I used to give me credit for that. Now, all of a sudden, you try to pull. Okay, I see. That's cool. I thought we was all here at the same time when that happened. Sorry, whatever. Anyway, that was the win I felt like for the Eagles. It's like, look, that's a game a good team wins. And I know, like, I try not to get into this touchy-feely, like, intangible narrative type stuff. But that, to me, looked like one of those where, like, yo, if you're a good team, this is the kind of game that you win. Not that they wouldn't be a good team if they lost it, but I say you're a good team if you win it. They got it. Except, well, it ended with uh, Nick Foles. Anyway, uh, here is Doug Peterson saying that he thinks the team's going to be all right. You sure can. Heck yeah. Um, we overcame a Pro Bowl left tackle. Um, we overcame our middle linebacker. We've overcome a running back. We've overcome a, a core special teams player this year, our kicker this year. Uh, this is no no different. Um, you know, yeah, he is the quarterback of our football team. And uh, each one of these guys that I mentioned is tough to replace. Tough to replace. I sure hope that made him feel better about himself. I mean, look, and I'm not knocking him for that. Like, I feel like sometimes them just the lies you got to tell on occasion. Like, you get in a situation like that, you are required to lie. Like, hey, man, we're going to be all right without him. Hell yeah, we're going to be all right with this guy that we traded lots of first-round picks to get because we thought he was special. We don't need special. That's why we traded all those picks to get him. Look, man, these are just the lies that you have to tell under those circumstances. And here he is talking about Nick Foles. He's going to, Nick Foles, excuse me, Nick Foles is going to step in at quarterback. The reason we went out and got Nick Foles is for reasons like this and for situations like this. And uh, I'm excited for Nick, obviously. I hate it for Carson Wentz. I hate it for uh, the season, I guess, that he's he's been having. But at the same time, it's it's been the next man up mentality. And, and that's that's how we approach it this week. I mean, to be fair to the Eagles, as far as backup quarterback situations go, I do kind of feel like they have a good one. Like, I don't think Nick Foles is great. But if you wound up in a situation where your quarterback is down for a while, I don't know how many better guys they were going to be that aren't currently starters somewhere that you can get than Nick Foles. And Nick Foles had, I mean, the most anomalous month, non-Tebow division, uh, two months really, in the history of the NFL. We've seen him be, quite honestly, the greatest quarterback of all time. What was it, 27, t- 27 touchdowns and two interceptions? All right, we, go, we ain't never going to be able to explain that. Where that 30 for 30 at? Right? Like that, like that's the one that we need to uh, need to produce there. Now, one second, though. If we can go back and play that first side we have from Doug Peterson, the one I keep saying is him telling the lies that he's got to tell. I want you to hear something, though. You sure can. Heck yeah. Um, we overcame a Pro Bowl left tackle. Um, 
We overcame our middle linebacker. We've overcome a running back. We've overcome a, a core special teams player this year, our kicker this year. Uh, this is no no different. Um, you know, yeah, he is the quarterback of our football team. And uh, each one of these guys that I mentioned is tough to replace. Tough to replace. Okay, so there are a couple of things here. He got to that, yeah, he is our quarterback. See, that's how we knew you was lying, bro. Right, once you said that, like you can go get somebody else to do all these other jobs. You can find a way around some of the weaknesses of cats at all these other jobs. Replacing your quarterback is a different animal. Like, y'all ain't about to be out here talking this Wensylvanian MVP stuff and then be like, no, we'll be good with Nick Foles. I mean, what's the difference? If there was no difference between that dude and Nick Foles, you know who would have been your starting quarterback this year? That's right, Nick Foles. He would have been that guy. Like You wouldn't have been trading picks and everything else. But where Peterson is coming from is just the standpoint of, look, this is football. Somebody get hurt next man up. That's the only way that you can look at it. I do wonder, though, as he listed all those different players that the Eagles have had who were hurt, I mean, it catches up at some point. These things stack. All right, so yeah, you were able to replace Jason Peters when he went out. You were able to replace Darren Sproles. You were able to replace Jordan Hicks. Special teams, dude. I got his name in front of him, but I ain't going to say it right. I don't feel like I need to know his name to do my job. Anyway, you can lose all those dudes, and you're right. You can lose right. But at some point, these things start stacking up, and where they go from here gets to be interesting. I saw an email that came across here at ESPN with tell some experts about who it was that they, you know, who they thought was now the best team in the NFC, given the injury that uh, Carson Wentz suffered. Yo, man, different guys have different opinions on this. For example, our guy Aaron Schatz is like, yo, he's still going with the Eagles. He thinks the Eagles roster is that loaded, that that's still the guy that they're going to go with. It's still the team that he's going with. He says with everybody else the Eagles have, he still thinks that they're the best team in the NFC. Uh, ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Shannon, are they that good? Like, is, is their roster that loaded? Like, I feel like if their roster was that loaded, we would have known it before the season started. I think it's more about just the other teams that you look at in the NFC right now because the, the other teams with the, with, the, with the good records are what? Saints? What, Saints, Falcons, and Panthers, all those jumbled uh, up in the NFC South. Vikings. Vikings and who? The Rams. I mean, that's the competition right there. So I'd imagine that Philly, even without Wentz, is still within that group. I mean, are, are you, I, I, don't, I don't know what makes you so sure of that one, right? Now, I'll tell you what the, what the Vikings do have, an extra quarterback. They did. In case you guys need a quarterback, we we got we got an extra sitting over here right on. Oh, in fact, we have a third one too. His knee just hurt right now. Y'all remember him? He used to play for y'all. Yeah, you remember that? I I totally forgot about I already Sam forgot, Bradford. I already forgot. And not only, not only did you forget about Sam Bradford, I feel like you also forgot that Sam Bradford had ever played for the Eagles. Because to be fair, that was a little bit of an easy thing to forget. Wait, and and who was Sam Bradford traded for? Ah, uh, they got a pick back. They got a pick back, and then they made Carson Wentz the starter. He was, they, traded for, he was traded for Nick Foles. They did get Nick Foles in that trade, didn't they? Oh, that's right. They traded Sam Bradford to the Rams, Yeah, and they got Nick right? Foles back. Yeah, along with, like, picks and stuff like that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Wow, all of the, it's all full circle. It's all together. Eagles fans, have I done anything to make you feel better? I mean, I can't imagine how frustrating this thing is. And I know this because y'all been so damn obnoxious talking about Carson Wentz that I can't imagine what the pain is now that you can't do that to us no more. I, I have no idea what that is. And hey, man, that dude's got it. Like, I don't think that Wentz is a consistently good player, but he has enough plays in the game. We're just like, oh, my goodness. I didn't know somebody could do that. Now you got Nick Foles, who is, well, consistently something. Consistently... Is he consistently inconsistent, Shannon? Is he one of those? Does he does he qualify on that one? I would know Chris Long is thinking about this, by the way, because the Eagles are all like, that's all right, we can win with Nick Foles. They, they, the whole team's like, yo, we can win with Nick Foles. It's cool. We, 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 we straight. We can win with Nick Foles. Chris Long's like, yeah, we tried that, bro. We we gave that a go. Um, we didn't win. I mean, we'd like to win with Nick Foles, but, you know. Like, what do you think Chris Law is doing every time somebody asks him his honest opinion about Nick Foles? What do you think about Nick? Are you cool? He real cool. He he does some things, you know. Yeah. He throw it around a bit, and hand yeah. it off. Yeah, he all right. He 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 all right. Yeah, by the way, Shannon, where's Chase Daniel these days? Somebody just got about mentions to say you can't forget about the best that never was, Chase Daniel. Chase Daniel, where, where is he now making more money than he should for being the greatest quarterback that never ever has to play? Ah, uh, he's in New Orleans. He's back in New Orleans. Oh. Yeah. 
back, back where it all began, where he developed his wonderful reputation as the best quarterback that never, ever actually has to play. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Oh, man, I guess Eagles fans too depressed to give a call in, man. They're a little bummed out about the thing that wound up happening. Uh, I almost feel like this, though, as a fan, I, I was like a fan of a team like the Eagles. I'd almost feel relieved, right? Like now your team can't actually break your heart. You know what I mean? Like, like if they still have Carson Wentz and everything, the inevitable loss will wind up being crushing and soul destroyed. But instead, since you know how this thing is probably going to go as you got Nick Foles, I imagine it'll be a little bit more gentle. Right, the inevitable, like y'all weren't gonna win it anyway because y'all don't never win nothing. Was gonna wind up going away, and now you can just be like, you know what? We had a great season. You can hold on to what might have been because there's nothing better in this world as a sports fan than that championship. Y'all know y'all was gonna win, except that one thing happened. Shannon, don't you Giants fans have one of those from 2008? Whew! I'm glad that's the one you was going with. I thought you were going to '94. Appreciate it, Bo. What happened in '94? Huh? What? What? Huh? Oh, oh! You're talking the Knicks. Ah, uh, my fault. I was talking about mm-hmm. the Giants. Yeah. You know, with uh, Plexico. Uh, yeah. Bang, bang. Mm-hmm. Or was it just solitary bang? I don't remember if it was one bang or two bangs, but it was enough. Uh, anyway, so yeah, Eagles fans, you'll have that one. Everybody's got one. They'll be like, man, what would have happened? The what if championship? The what if championship is the best. Think about that, you as a fan. Whatever team you root for, I bet you got you one of them what if championships. I bet Patriots fans ride out 2008 is one of those. And Brady hurt his knee, man. If he, if he hadn't got hurt, we'd have gone undefeated again. Yeah, yeah. That's what it would have been. Oh, look at Nuno. Nuno think he got jokes, Shannon. Nuno's asking what if the man of the year didn't solicit a prostitute on a January uh, early morning in 1999. It's a fair question, by the way. It's a fair question. No, no that's a good question, though. Please give, uh, give us a call if you have your favorite uh, would, would you word it, the what if championship? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm a little in my own feelings right now. Oh. Thanks to people who claim to be my friends but don't actually love me. Yes, that's what I got. I should talk about John Starks for the rest of the way so Shannon can feel the pain too. You know, a Knicks fan, you remember that? John Starks, H-Town legend. Anyway, moving on. John Carlos Stanton got traded to the Yankees. As many of you know, I live in New York City now. And not that there was a shortage of Yankees fans in New York City, but a whole lot more seemed to pop up out the ground after uh, this decision for Stanton to come there. Although, Shadow, correct me if I'm wrong. Doesn't Stanton already play for the Yankees? I see where you're going there with that. I'm serious. I thought he already played there. They got the big old straw black dude in right field already, right? That's not Stanton? It's Aaron Judge. No, them cats need to like trade uniforms to see if anybody notices all this stuff, right? All of the they seem as though they are the same dude in many ways. But anyway, uh, Stanton is now there. Now, here's what I think is interesting. You know, we always talk about like the difference between the millionaires and the billionaires, right? When we talk about player stuff, where the players are millionaires, the owners are billionaires, and a whole lot of people I think struggle with the idea that you know just because the players are rich in your mind, that does not mean they are like. Like owner rich, I feel like what's happening right now with Derek Jeter is spelling out what the difference of this is. Because what it sounds like is they just can't afford to actually play, and it raises a real question about Major League Baseball as to why they approved this sale. Because I think we knew from a long way out that the first thing that the Jeter Group was going to try to do once they got control was they were going to try to move Stanton's contract. Now, my thought was this. If you did not feel like this team could afford Stanton's contract, then you don't buy the team until Stanton's contract is gone. If you can't afford the possibility that you get stuck with the deal, then you cannot afford the team. So then they got there. Stanton has a no clay, no trade clause in his contract. They tried to move him to a couple of places that Stanton wasn't going for. And what did that leave? The Yankees. That's it. It left the Yankees. Now, we'll get to the Yankees part in a second, but here is Marlins CEO Derek Jeter explaining why it is that they traded their best player. I think the one thing that uh, you know everyone needs to realize is this is an organization that has not been successful. They have not been in the playoffs since 2003. I don't understand how the fan base feels because they've been through quite a bit. But for us here, we haven't been winning. So if you haven't been winning, then it's time to make a change. And in order to make a change, there's going to have to be some moves. And uh, like I said, 
that you uh, alluded to, there may be some unpopular decisions at times. But every decision that we make as an organization is to try to put us in a better position. We're trying to fix something that is broken. But the question is, did this actually fix anything? Because I'm not one of them dudes that's thumbing through the Baseball America to figure out who the best prospects are. I can't speak to that. But, Shannon, from what I've read, correct me if I'm wrong here, they didn't really get back anybody, like, great. They had to get back something. And they, and they got back prospects. They also got back a, a, a starter. So they'll, they'll, they'll have that. But it wasn't anything great. I guess they had to get what they can get because Stanton was leaving. Yeah, that's the issue. If you're in a position where you're like, we got to get what we can get, then you can't make this trade. Right? Like, there has to be some prospect that you can hold up and tell people, like, yo, this is what it's going to be. Rather than, hey, sometimes the decisions are going to be unpopular, you got to at least get back a hall where you can look at people and be like, yo, yo, this is the part that you're missing. Look how good this guy is. We really think this guy could be really good. Look what that is. Instead, Jared Jeter's like, what y'all don't realize is y'all been sorry. They know they've been sorry, dog. Everybody's aware of the fact that they've been sorry. They know that. They absolutely know that. And so what winds up happening is you ship the dude out of here. Now, my man, uh, Dan Levitard, he's been around this Marlins team for quite a while, and he uses this to point to something I thought of immediately also. The Marlins, again, have traded their great right-handed hitter. When do you ever see the MVP, MVP of the league in his prime? Ah, sorry, can't do it. The Marlins, guys, listen to what I'm saying here. The Marlins have had two of the worst trades in the history of baseball. Right up there with Ruth, they traded Miguel Cabrera, and now they've traded the replacement for Miguel Cabrera, the guy who became Miguel Cabrera. So no, no franchise in the history of sports has done that. Like, that's never happened before where you have these – you trade Ruth once and it stays with you for 100 years. They've, re, they've traded Ruth twice in the last 15 What's weird about the Marlins is they're in a perpetual fire sale. But the thing I think that we don't talk enough about when it comes to the Marlins is, so the Marlins have been in business since 1993. They haven't been as terrible as I think that people would speak to. Like, they've been a couple, like, they've had, out of those seasons, I think they've had two 100 loss seasons, like a relatively small number of 90 win seasons, but they tend to have wins that cluster between the mid 70s and the mid 80s. Like, they're perpetually nondescript. I think I would look at them a little bit differently as a franchise if they were just like, you know, 40 and 120 coming out here, but they're just perpetually nondescript. Like, they never give anybody any reason to actually get invested. Dude, best baseball seats I've ever had in my life. I got two seats for $30 a piece in the eighth row behind home plate 15 minutes before the first pitch once at that stadium, right? Like, they don't give anybody any reason to halfway care at all. And Dan taps on something else I was thinking here, man. It just sounds like the guys that own the Marlins are broke. We were told this would stop, not that it would be worse than it's ever been. They can't afford anything. Jeter's coming out here with his hand out, like, Jeter uh, has this name, and baseball gave him a gift because they want his name around this team. And the other buyer, a Cuban guy from Miami, planned to have a payroll. He planned to spend, and baseball gave it to this guy. And Jeter overspent $1.1 billion for a franchise in South Florida that nobody cares about. Like, they, they paid $1.1 billion because baseball's running a racket. I'm telling you, they gifted this to Derek Jeter in a way that should be bothersome to anybody who cares about competitive sports. They did, though. Like, they can't afford to play. And I thought one thing baseball would learn from the McCourt situation was you can't be giving teams to guys who can't afford them. And that just seems to be the bottom line on this one. And, of course, the winners are the New York Yankees. And uh, let's go here. Here's uh, John Carlos Stanton on his way out of Miami with one last thing to say. No structure, no no, um, no stamp of this is how things are going to be. It's a, it's a different direction every spring training. you got to learn something new every spring, a different manager. Yeah, Shannon doesn't sound like he's so sad about leaving. It does not. And I don't blame him, though. He didn't want to be part of another yet another rebuild down there in Miami. It was time to go. I don't blame and, him. And now we're going to see how much America cares about baseball because the strongest man on earth now plays for the biggest franchise on earth with the other strongest man on earth already being there. Like, if this can't get people interested, I don't know what will do it. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Our guest joining us on the show, Penzo Performance Line. We'll talk to Jonah Carey in just a second about the Stanton trade. In the meantime, we're talking about these great what-if scenarios that, you know, like the Eagles right now, they got a what-if championship. What if Carson Wentz had not gotten hurt? But some of y'all still optimistic. Let's hit the phone. Let's talk to Devin and Richmond. Devin, thanks for calling the right time. 
Hey, what up, Bo? Doing How you right. doing, Shannon? Hey, Shannon, the Giants still suck, I don't, uh, even though the Eagles are not doing well. Um, Anyway. Um, friends, damn. <laughs> oh, every time I call, I give a shout-out to Shannon. Appreciate um, that. Anyway. I, I don't know, man. I, I'm, I'm really, I really hurt. I, when I saw him winch last night, no pun intended, um, coming off the field, holding his mouth over his, uh, holding his hand over his mouth, I was like, this is gonna be bad. So I've been getting memed all day. I mean, if if Nick Foles wins us one game in the playoffs, and we somehow get to the shift, I guess it's still a successful season. Yeah, I, I feel like you Eagles fans need to not be greedy. And Devin, I appreciate the call. You've absolutely had a successful season. You should be happy with what you got. You ain't had this much in quite a while. Oh, so Devin come up here talking trash, but now he's settling for more victories, huh? Oh, it was all good it just is. a week ago, wasn't it? Huh? <laughs> tell him, Shad. Tell him why you mad, huh? Exactly. 888-729-3776. That is our telephone number. All right, on the phone with us now. He covers baseball, CBS Sports, and for SI. His name is Jonah Carey. All right, Jonah, what's your read on the Stanton trade? I mean, it's one of those things where the Yankees kind of they were shrewd to make the moves they made, but it fell into their laps a little bit because the Cardinals were probably the best fit in terms of a trade. They have so much young pitching. There could have definitely been a deal. San Francisco was after them, too. And then Stanton just exercises no trade clause. And so now you're down to just a handful of teams. And the Yankees are in position where they could say, okay, here's 32 cents on the dollar, yay or nay, and Jeter's buying the eight ball until the deal happens. So Starling Castro and you know some kind of B-plus level prospects, that's a pretty darn good deal. Even with the financial load that they have to take, Stanton, first of all, could opt out after three years, and secondly, he's the defending MVP. And third, the Yankees have more money than God, so I don't really see a downside here. It's a great deal for them. Yeah, for the Yankees, it's great. For the Marlins, though, I feel like if you were behind the eight ball on making this trade, doesn't this speak out to the fact that they probably couldn't afford to buy the team in the first place? That's exactly right. And, you know, they're, presumably what they're doing is they're trying to get rid of their debt and kind of start from zero and all that. But, gee, I mean, you know, don't show your hand when you're sitting at the poker table. At least have some tact about it or whatever. It was a very odd thing. There's nothing wrong with trading Stanton per se. It is the case that he's been injury prone before. It is the case that he's owed, you know, nearly $300 million. Uh, we don't know how this is going to go. And also there's a lot of power in today's game. So it's not like it's a rare commodity, even as much as he hits for more power than anybody else. But still, I mean, you know, you still have to recognize he's defending MVP and, and go accordingly. Yeah, this was just a botch all the way around. You don't, you just don't do that. You don't come in with a position of weakness because this is what happens. All right, talking to Jonah Carey of SI.com here on The Right Time. Now, with the Yankees, do you have any concern about the fact that Stanton and Aaron Judge are not the exact same player but very similar? <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, you know, Mantle and Maris and – I don't know, McCovey and Mays. I mean, you've had, I guess McCovey and Mays weren't exactly the same, but you've had multiple power guys on one team, and that's fine. Obviously, the Yankees will have to leaven that a little bit with some speed and athleticism elsewhere. But Stanton and Judge can go get it a little bit for big guys. You know, they're not too bad defensively. They do some other things, so that's fine. Uh, but really what it's going to come down to is how they fill out the rest of the roster. Starting pitching, you know, they have Tanaka. They have Severino, who was fantastic last year, and Gray. The rest of the rotation is real thin, so that would require some up, uh, upgrading. But if you think about what they did last season, they led the majors in home runs, and they had a monster bullpen, and they almost made the World Series. They came up just short. Well, now they have an even better lineup, and they still have the monster bullpen. And if they come back with the same rotation, who's to say they can't do it again? So even if they stopped here, I think they're in pretty good shape. And, you know, if, it's two, if you had two of the same commodity and they were both guys who hit 200 and made a bunch of errors, okay, that's bad. If you have two guys who combined to hit 111 home runs, well, my very advanced analysis will say that's probably good. <laughs> we're talking to Jonah Carey here on The Right Time. Uh, now for the Marlins, they got Starling Castro. I guess we're expecting that he will also be traded. What do you think they can fetch for him? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, he, he hit all right last year. He had 300, moderate power, but he's a real poor defender in the middle infield. Doesn't really draw any walks. It's the same reason that the Cubs traded him to them all those years ago, that he was signed to a contract that was the same contract, by the way, not too onerous. But it was sort of like, all right, this is the extent of his skills. If you remember, he came into the majors in his early 20s. That was a 200-hit guy. But that doesn't have the same currency that it used to because 200 hits isn't enough. We could look at, you know, defensive runs saved, and we could look at walk percentage, and we could look at all this other stuff and say, this is not a complete ball player, and he isn't a complete ball player. So if they just traded D. Gordon, and they didn't get a ton for him. He's a little bit like D. Gordon, more power and less speed, but sort of empty calories kind of batting average, if that makes sense. 
that's kind of what we're dealing with. And he's a worse defender than Gordon was. So I don't think they're going to get a ton, to be honest with you. Even though he's a useful player, he's certainly nothing close to a great player. Now, one of your great contributions is that you also do a lot on the business end, not just baseball, but just business in general. Are you mm-hmm. surprised, given the Frank McCourt debacle, that baseball would still be doing business with guys that could not afford teams? Well, I mean, the previous owner of the Marlins was not so fresh either. <laughs> so I think they viewed anything as an upgrade over Jeffrey Loria. But frankly, I'm not sure that they thought that, that Bruce Sherman would come in and do this, to strip it to the to the studs. I don't know. And and there's nothing, again, I want to emphasize, there's nothing wrong with the rebuild. We just saw the Houston Astros win a World Series. And man, oh man, did they go scorched earth. They had 0.0 local TV ratings. I mean, they got rid of everything. And even the Cubs, as exalted as they are, they traded everybody, right? I mean, they, they just waited and they stripped it down. And they were able to win, too. So it's not that per se. It's just if you're going to make the rebuild, then go get good guys. You know, if you go back and think about the Cubs, one of the big trades that they made a few years ago was they got rid of, was it Jason Hamill and, and uh, Samarja, and they got Addison Russell. Okay, well, that's a real trade. You know, Russell's a contributor, an up-the-middle guy, uh, team-controlled for six years. That's what you want. So trade Stanton, trade Gordon, trade everybody. No problem. But go get real assets. It's that that the Marlins didn't do. So, yes, of course it's the case that it seems to be a financial panic, but it's also, even if you're in a financial, if you're in a bad spot, a good general manager will get it done. Well, if Jeter is the de facto head of baseball operations and he's been doing that job for, I don't know, 12 minutes, I don't know that you could expect him to necessarily outfox, let's say, Brian Cashman, who's been doing it for more than two decades. All right, last question for Joni Carey of SI.com here on The Right Time. Uh, does this take the Yankees out of the Bryce Harper sweepstakes next year? It might, but I don't really see that as a problem at all because Harper is one player on the open market. There are four superstars who are going to come out. That's Harper, that's Manny Machado, who, by the way, plays third base, and the Yankees could certainly use a better third baseman. Josh Donaldson, another great third baseman, a little older, but he could be a great addition. And the fourth guy who's really intriguing, and I think he stays put, but he could certainly opt out of his contract if he wants to, and that's Clayton Kershaw. And now you're talking about something else altogether where that would be exactly what the Yankees or any other team could really use. So, yeah, maybe they don't need a third power-hitting right fielder. That's totally fine. But Machado, Donaldson, Harper, or, you know, just kind of mixing and matching with guys, all of those are options. And the Yankees will, I'm sure, continue to be aggressive. They built that kind of baby bomber core, just like in the 90s when Rivera and Posada and Jeter and Williams and Pettit, they're all young and cheap. They built around those guys. They went out and they got Brocious and O'Neill and eventually Clemens and those guys. Yankees have Sanchez and Judge and Severino. They can build around that young core and go spend some money. Whether it's on Harper, whether it's on Machado, they're kind of no bad outcomes here. But then once they started spending all that money, the World Series curiously started slowing down a little bit. But that is a discussion for another day <laughs> with Joe DeCary. Check about CBS Sports, also SI.com. Thanks so much, my man. I appreciate it. Thanks, Bo. Always a pleasure. I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to Geico. I've never felt more alive. Disclaimer, GEICO cannot guarantee you will feel more alive. You either possess functioning respiratory and circulatory systems, or you do not, or you are a zombie. If you are indeed a brain-starved zombie and you would like to save money on car insurance, the GEICO legal team applauds your excellent life choices, even in your shambling afterlife. But we strongly encourage you to visit GEICO.com or download the GEICO app. Please stay a minimum of 500 feet away from our large and presumably delicious, delicious brains. GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Yo, man, they was wildin' in Jacksonville. And when I say they was wildin', I mean they. Like, I feel like it's a little bit of everybody that was wildin'. Though I don't feel like the Jacksonville Jaguars themselves were necessarily wildin'. But it came down to the end of the game. They're doing that thing where they're in the victory formation. What Michael Bennett called himself trying to swipe at the snap. That's what that's that's his story on what he was doing, even though what it looked like he was doing was diving at the knees of the Jacksonville offensive line. Keeping in mind that Michael Bennett played for the Bucks when Greg Schiano was there. Remember the way we ridiculed Schiano for telling those dudes to play the victory formation just in case something was happening and Michael Bennett as I recall was one of the cats who talked about what a ridiculous thing that was and there he is being the guy to play against the victory formation so then that happened he wound up in a thing with buddy from the Jaguars and didn't try to roll up his leg it looked like he got him from behind and tried to get his knee do I have that right yeah that's accurate and then they wind up on the ground. They wrestling. Uh, Sheldon Richardson comes in. He throws a punch at somebody. Little Fournette comes in because Little Fournette is like, oh, baby, it looks like we got a chance to fight out here. 
And so then Leonard Fournette comes in there, and then what's this dude's name? Uh, Quentin Jefferson. Never heard of that dude before. He winds up getting kicked out of the game. He's walking toward the sideline. The Jacksonville fans are screaming at him. He's going back and forth with the fans. Couple people threw brew at him. Second dude threw some brew at him. He quote unquote tried to go into the stands, but then somebody with a polo shirt on put their hand on his shoulder, and then he stopped from going in the stands, and then everybody then wound up going in the tunnel. And oh, by the way, Pete Carroll tried to get his Jeff Van Gundy on, running out there while everything was going on, and all he's going to wind up doing is grabbing somebody's ankle and being dragged. But here's what uh, Pete had to say about why it is he ran out there. I was just trying to slow him down. I talked to, to Gene about it before this couple plays before it, and uh, that's I just tried to make a, a statement to our guys so we didn't finish with any more garbage happening out there. But um, yeah, I, I've, I've seen every one of our guys, and, and uh, yeah, he just kind of lost it. Somebody poured a beer on his head walking out of the stadium, you know. So I told him that's pro football. They they pay to get in. They can do whatever they want. I guess. All right, so yeah, there's that's that's the uh, Jefferson guy. Now, to me, I feel like we got two different levels of things going on here. Number one is the Michael Bennett level, where I think Michael Bennett was just wrong. I don't think there's any way that you could argue that Michael Bennett was anything other than wrong. And Sheldon Richardson and coming in throwing punches, I mean, you can't really make an argument that that's right. But the Michael Bennett, I think that you can make a clear argument that he was wrong. My man Jefferson, hey man, you throw something at somebody, they come at you. I ain't seen nothing. Police come in a circumstance like that. What happened? All I saw was somebody throw something. Something happened after that? No, I missed that. All I saw was a dude that threw something. No, 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 no. Uh, my buddy Jimmy Israel way back had a great line about the malice of the palace. He said, there's nothing noble about letting people throw bleep at you. And that's what that was. Like, fans get out there and start feeling entitled and everything else and start throwing stuff at people. Hey, man, I think that that went best-case scenario for all parties involved with Jefferson. Jefferson rolled over there and did just enough to let them cast know that the bear bite back. They stopped him from actually getting up in the stands, so we did not have a horrible situation. I feel like somebody up there probably learned a lesson because there's some of them out there like, oh, yeah, you wish you could come up there. There's at least one of those people up there whose heart was like, oh, no, somebody get him. Somebody please stop him from coming up here. There had to be at least one person. I was like, oh, please, no, no, don't let him kill me. Please don't let him kill me. Like my thing, I didn't want to see a fight, but I was just curious to see if Jefferson was going to be able to scale the wall. That's what I wanted to see. I think he could have. That's How many, Like, how long do you think it would have taken him to scale the wall, though? How long do you think it would have taken? I mean, obviously he was just trying to scare the dude. Because when, when, when Buddy came and put his hand on his shoulder, he immediately dropped down. Like, I didn't feel like he had a serious investment in going up there and trying to get that dude. But I do feel like every now and then, maybe it's just every couple of years, I'm not sure what. But every now and then, I feel like fans need a reminder. These dudes will come up there, and if they get their hands on you, they will take your dome off like the top of a jelly jar. Like, everything, everybody needs that reminder. You just can't be out here talking to people any way that you want to. Now, a big shock for me in this, Adam Schefter is reporting that none of Seattle's players will be suspended, though this is still under review. And I thought that Michael Bennett was going to get multiple games for this. And I think it would have been fair to give him multiple games. Now, don't look at it in the context of, like, comparatively with Rob Gronkowski or anything else. If this league is a league that says they care about player safety, you can't be rolling up people's legs. Like, your dome is not the only thing that I think the league has some incentive to try to keep safe. Like, that's where I think it's like the laziest thing the NFL has going there is all we worried about is head injuries, as if these other injuries don't matter, as if these other injuries don't have dudes winding up taking these painkillers, as if these dudes don't wind up getting strung out on these painkillers, as if that is not a long-range consequence of playing football. Yeah, no, no, no. I thought Bennett absolutely should have got a suspension for what it was that he did. Um, Quentin Jefferson? Nah, 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 nah. And in fact... Okay, so here's Quentin Jefferson, and then the next voice that you'll hear is Michael Bennett. I, I can't really explain to you how this is going to go, but here's Quentin Jefferson. I don't know how, what I'm supposed to do. Like, I'm a human just like anybody else. Like, I'm, not, I'm a man just like the, the other man in the stands. And I'm not going to let somebody disrespect me and throw a bear on me. Like, just because I'm playing football, I'm still a human being. I'm still a man. And so I'm out there playing, playing a game. And at the end of, end of the day, it's a game, and I'm a man. I'm not going to let somebody disrespect me like that. Going into the stands, do you think that was that was the right call? Was you still? I don't know. Back? Was it the right call for him to throw? No, it wasn't. It, it absolutely wasn't. I'm just wondering. If I'm just that wondering if it was the right call for him to throw a beer on me. Did that happen as you were first making your way out? I'm walking. I'm not talking to nobody. I'm walking out. Somebody throw a beer, and then somebody throws another drink. What would you do? 
what, what was said and, and it looked like you were jumping at each other. What does that mean? What does that mean? Stop asking the question. That's what you say. Something to do something. You know, we got, we got, you a man with four kids. If you want to say something, don't say it. Move on. Tell me you got your face. Can I ask you a question about the game? Just a question about the game. He doesn't want to talk anymore. Move away from me. He doesn't want to talk anymore. He doesn't want to talk anymore. He's emotional right now. Thanks, you, 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 Thanks, win. Guys. you guys win. You guys win. We appreciate That's it. That's what you guys want to see. You want to see him act a certain way? Move out the way he's done. The man was disrespected. People threw his food on him. He's not an animal. He's a human being. So get out of here. He a human being. How would you like if one of your kids are playing sports or somebody threw beer on him? Exactly. So don't, don't come in with that then. Yo, first of all, buddy that was asking new questions was shook. Well, my man was like, whoa, was he wrong? Oh, yeah, 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 he was wrong, he was wrong, yeah, 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 he was wrong. Like, he knew he was navigating down the road that he did not necessarily want to see all the way to the end. And then Michael Bennett came in there, and I don't think that Michael Bennett needed to come do that for that grown man. At the same time, I do look at the writers and wonder why they didn't turn to Michael Bennett and be like, all right, so let's talk to you then. Now, you had a pretty big role in what was going on here. Perhaps you'd like to answer the questions. If you feel like your man's over here, doesn't need to answer the questions. Although, when my man said, do you think going to the crowd was the right move? He was trying to get him. He was like, yeah. and his job is to try to get him, to be fair. He's like, yeah, let me see, let me see, let me, let me see how far this cat's going to go. This cat basically just hits you with, if you throw something at me, I'm coming for you. Which I feel like all football players should have on their jerseys. They should put a patch on there. Throw something at me and see what happens. Like, go ahead. Let's just, let, let's see how this ends. Throw something at me and see how this ends. I'd get it. I'd understand. I think one thing with the with him going into the stands is kind of overshadow the Michael Bennett's actions during the game. As you alluded to earlier in the segment, he deserves a suspension. But here we are today, mostly focusing on him going to the stands and not Bennett twisting the guy's leg. There's that. I will say this though, just in the discussion of like this idea of going in the stands, I do feel like if if Jefferson would have got up there in the stands, it would have been an outrage to most people. But to me, it would have served as a public service announcement. Just to let everybody know, this is the worst case scenario of what can happen to you. And Carol said that, you know, that I guess they pay money to come to the games. They can do whatever they want, I guess. There seemed to be a whole lot more security on the sidelines than there was on the front row. And I would think at the end of a football game, you need to have a little bit more security up there because folks be out here wilding. 888-729-3776. 888-729-3776. That's our telephone number. We were talking a little earlier about the Eagles and what they're going to do now. Let's hit the phone. Talk to DJ Mike Kitman. Mike, what's going on? Santa Claus is coming to your town. Oh, hey, Bo. Bo, tell Philadelphia, run out to get one of the Philly State and run to your nearest mall and take it to Santa Claus and ask them, could we win the Super Bowl? Hold it, Bo. Santa Claus, listen to your radio station. And he just sent me a text. He said, tell them they'll never remember when they threw snow at me. And he put a lamp behind them. Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Here come the Cowboys. How do you like that, Philadelphia? <laughs> My God, you turned this into something about the Cowboys, man. Because when you do, when you do 90 things to Santa Claus and he texts me, he's a friend of man, he told me to remind you that they did those snow on him, at him. And he ain't going to never forget that. So he put a good laugh behind it. Oh, oh, oh. Merry Christmas, Philadelphia. There go your Super Bowl dreams. And here come the Cowboys. You know what, Bo? That guy who played, came from Miami, played in hot weather. He never played in nobody in nobody cold. And as Zeke is coming back, he played in Ohio State. I think it get cold down there. If you had a good quarterback, you would have kept folks. Tell him, tell him he wasn't that good. That's why you trade them. You got them back. You trade them. You got them back. Oh, pick on the Cowboys. Ho, 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 Philadelphia. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Mike, I, I, I appreciate the call, man. I, I do. By the way, Shannon, the Cowboys still in the playoff race. Like, I was dismissing that idea, but they're still there. Yeah, the, the Cowboys and the playoff race, all that stuff is good. I, I'm, I was listening throughout Mike's call to see when he was going to reference the Giants-Cowboys game. And he didn't do it, so I'm uh, grateful about that. You know he's going to call back now, right? The right time with Bomani Jones. So uh, San Francisco got a win against the Texans. Jimmy Garoppolo looked pretty good in that game. Uh, The story, though, for the Texans is Tom Savage suffered a concussion during the game. T.J. Yates wound up finishing the thing out. But Savage suffers a concussion. He's on the ground. His hands are shaking, uh, what many believe to be a seizure. 
He goes to the sideline. The neurologist clears him. He comes back. He plays some more. And then the neurologist doesn't clear him. And then he is out of the game. Now, this is something, again, that we pay a lot more attention to now than we used to. We're much more concerned about whether or not someone actually has any business out here playing football after they have suffered a head injury where dudes just used to, quote, unquote, play through it. In this case, when we see a dude who's trying to play through it, we are not here for it. Of course, the problem is the way that we glean whether or not someone is actually just playing through it or not has a lot to do with whether or not they are able to play through the bell ringing and Tom Savage was in a case where he could not play through the bell ringing and that is how we notice we're like I don't know about this one uh Bill O'Brien got a lot of hell about this one now here's Bill O'Brien after the game he doesn't want to come out of the game but again that's you know that's in the medical people's hands and um, you know they, they try to make the best decision for the player whatever they see and then the testing that they do they they try to make the best decision with the player and they weren't satisfied with the results of the second test so they they decided to um you know pull him and then that's when he went into the locker room now um on the at the press availability today that the Texans had, O'Brien was a bit more defensive about this, and understandably because I saw quite a few people who blamed him for the fact that he put Tom Savage back into the game. Now here's Bill O'Brien speaking today. With benefit of seeing the video, obviously from my 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 standpoint, the care for the player, I would have never let that player back in the game. At no point in time is there anything more important to me than the safety of our players. I love our players, and I care about them, and I cannot stand when players get injured. Again, with benefit of seeing the video that people are seeing, I would have never put him back in the game. But I don't see that. I'm not passing the buck. Anybody that's been on a sideline of a football game knows that from a coaching standpoint, you really can't see things like that. All right, so I think we have a couple of things here. One, uh, Bill O'Brien said, I can't stand seeing players get injured. Yeah, yes, you can. Like, I understand the point that you were ultimately trying to make, but the bottom line is if you can't stand watching players get injured, then this is the wrong business for you. This is a business that involves people getting hurt all the time, and if you can't stomach that, you got to keep it moving. And I think that's part of the problem that people have when it comes to these things is we are dealing with people who are desensitized to injuries and violence because you can't play football or be around football if you're not desensitized to those things. But the other part where O'Brien starts talking about, you know, on the side, Line, you're not able to see those things and so forth and so on. Look, I don't know what he did or did not see. I do believe, however, that people who watch football need to make a decision. Do you want the coach to be involved in these decisions or not? Because I think the play that everybody needs to make on something like this is that the coach absolutely not be involved in this decision. The doctor says the guy can play, then the coach is going to put the guy out there to play. If the doctor says that the guy can't play, then the coach just has to take the guy out. You do not want to be in a situation where the coach is being asked to make a judgment call as to whether or not somebody is able to play. Because the coach is far too compromised in these circumstances for you to trust his opinion. The coach, I believe, absolutely has to take somebody else's word for it. The reason that they have what the unaffiliated neurological whatever you want to call him is he's not affiliated the idea is that that guy does not have a dog in the fight therefore his opinion can be trusted over the coach and the player both of whom absolutely want that guy to be out there at all costs the player by and large wants somebody to throw him out there he just wants the green light so that he can go ahead and play the coach wants the green light so he can put his best players out there on the field the doctor has to be the one who makes the decision now i don't know how how exactly it went for the doctor when it came to that concussion test. I don't know what the pressures are for the doctors or like what their tiebreaker is, right? Like if something like this happens, is the doctor's tiebreaker, we're going to put them out on the field unless we have something going the other way? Like, you know what I mean? Like which way are they going on this sort of thing? But under no circumstance whatsoever should it ever be Bill O'Brien's call to throw a guy back out there on the field. Under no circumstance ever should it be Bill O'Brien's call to take a guy out of a game. That is a call that should entirely be made by the doctors. And I think all of us understand and can agree that the doctors should be the ones to make the call. If we're going to have a circumstance, however, where the doctors are the ones who make the call, then I also think that you then have to absolve Bill O'Brien from blame when something like that happens. What it is, though, for us is it becomes very, very easy because we understand the cutthroat nature of football. It becomes very easy for us to look at the coach and be like, man, you so care, you so concerned about the the wrong things and everything else that Bill O'Brien becomes an easy target and this doctor whose name we don't know we don't throw that out there at all no man either the coach has a vote or the coach doesn't have a vote and I feel like the coach absolutely 100% should not have a vote under these circumstances they sent that dude back out there they said he could play They come back to Bill O'Brien. They say, now he can't play. Okay, boom. He's out of there. What we wound up with in this circumstance, though, was the really, really disturbing video of Tom Savage's handshaking. 
And those are the things that give you your reminder, oh, by the way, this game is really, really violent. This game is not safe. This game is not a good idea. And so I feel like in a lot of ways we want to have a certain level of enforcement on these concussions that's kind of in line with the way that we talk about drunk driving. Oh, no, 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 no. We're not going to talk about the problems caused by drinking. We're going to talk about the problems caused by drinking and driving. Because, see, once we put it in there and we make it about the driving, then those of us who drink can ignore all the stuff that we talk about about whether the drinking is the bad idea. It's kind of the same thing here, right? Like, we want this fierce enforcement on this end about head injuries and everything else because at least we then feel like, well, hey, man, if we shut down these head injuries, then we can otherwise enjoy this thing that still has these guys beating their brains in. That's the spread. That's the change. That's how it goes. And so when a case like this comes up where you see Savage on the ground, oh, my God, get him off the field. Think about this with the concussion protocol and everything else. How often do you see them pull an offensive lineman out of a game for concussion protocol? My serious question. How often do you see it where an offensive line is offensive lineman is out of the game in the name of the concussion protocol? You don't see it very often, right? We see it with the guys that they like really, really notice. The guys that take the big hits. Those are the ones that they're able to see. Quarterbacks, receivers going over the middle, stuff like that. Those are the guys that you're really able to see under those circumstances. In fact, Shad, how often do you see a running back come out of a game in the name of a concussion? Usually if it's uh, something related to their legs, that's when they usually come out. But yeah, yeah, but concussion, we don't really see it in regards to running backs. No, we see defensive players who make the big hits, like linebackers, safeties, like those sorts of guys. We see those guys who wind up coming out for concussions. Do you think these other dudes don't suffer concussions? Do you think that guys along the line do not suffer concussions? Do you need to go look up the story of Mike Webster to see what his brain turned into playing on the line? No, we don't notice those. So nobody's really talking about those. I ain't ever heard anybody pop up and be like, you know, I think the uh, independent neurologist needs to spend more time making sure the offensive linemen are okay. No, 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 because that doesn't distort your comfort. That doesn't change it for you while you're out here watching the game. But when something like that happens to Savage, I feel like fans need to see some action happen there because then it allows them – to guiltlessly watch the rest of the game that we all know is a guilty pleasure. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. So the Thunder came back from down like a dub against the uh, Grizzlies. They are now 12-13. and 13. They are under 500. Um, there are a lot of questions to be asked about this team. Now, here's what is interesting to me about the Thunder. It's not all bad. The record, certainly not good. I feel as though all they really need to do is to get this thing going by the time the playoffs come around. Because if they get it going by the time the playoffs come around, the Thunder will then be, as far as I can tell, and you correct me if I'm missing somebody, the only team in the Western Conference with not one, not two, but three players who can get their own shots. And not one, but two players who can guard Kevin Durant. Like, I still think they're probably the team that is best equipped to beat the Warriors. They beat them one time they played this year, but I think that in terms of their roster, they're best equipped to do the hardest thing there is to do in that conference. Now, can they beat everybody else? I don't necessarily have the answer for you. But I do feel like about the playoffs, when everything grinds to a halt, dudes that can get their own shots are the most precious commodity, and they have them. We saw this with Golden State that year. They went 73-9. and nine. They only had one dude who could get his own shot, and that did wind up catching up to him when that dude wound up being hurt. They had nobody that could get their own shots. If you hear Steve Kerr talk about what Kevin Durant has added to the team, they're like, look, man, we needed another guy who could get his own shot. They just went out and got the best guy to get his own shot they could possibly find. But with the Thunder... A lot of the turn, I think, has come on Russell Westbrook. And one thing that hasn't helped Russ in that regard is that Victor Oladipo has gone up to Indiana and suddenly turned into Dwayne Wade or something like that, which then has people raising the questions and asking whether or not the problem he had in Oklahoma City was just that he was playing with Russell Westbrook, even though it's not like Victor Oladipo was playing like this in Orlando. Anyway. Russell Westbrook is shooting 39% from the field. That seems to be the issue, almost to a point where I wonder if Westbrook has some variety of injury because his free throw percentage is down, I want to say, 14% from last year. Like, it's a huge fall in a way that you don't see guys typically fall on free throw percentage. Um, I mean, that is a very rare thing for you to see under those circumstances. Whose fault is it, though? I don't have a great answer for this one. My question is, though, you got Melo, you got Paul George, you can't figure out how to get it done. I mean, that's the coach, right? And I'm not saying that I think that Billy Donovan should be fired necessarily. I am saying, though, that I understand that the way that the NBA works and the way the NBA typically works is if you got this collection of talent and you got the short time horizon to figure this out that Oklahoma City has, the coach is the person that we normally look at. 
Instead, this year, I find that we're doing a lot of looking at Russell Westbrook. Now, I haven't watched them enough to fully understand what the deal is with them, but here are the drops from last year. Last year, Russ shot 42.5% from the field. This year's 39.3. Last year, Russ shot 34.3% from three. This year's 30.9. Yo, those are big drops. And again, the free throw line. Last year, Russell Westbrook shot 84.5% from the free throw line. This year, it's 71.4. Keeping in mind, there has never been a season where Russell Westbrook has shot below 78% from the free throw line. He is so far below his career high, his career lows in all of these things that I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, so what exactly is going on? Is this entirely a matter of Russ commandeering the offense? I don't know if that's what it is. How much of this has to do with the fact that, like, Melo, I guess maybe I just look up the only times where Melo has a game where he shoots five for 20 or something like this. Uh, what is Paul George contributing, given that Paul George is not the most assertive cat. And more than anything else, you can complain about Russ all you want in this. Russ got the longest contract out of anybody involved in this. They got to figure out how to get this done around him. Whether you like it or not, they got to figure out how to get this done around him. But no, I'm not inclined to blame Russ for the fact that Carmelo Anthony is only shooting 40% from the floor and 34% from three. I'm not inclined to blame Russell Westbrook for the fact that Paul George is only shooting 42% from the floor. They got a whole lot of things that are going on, and the coach is supposed to be the guy that finds one way or another to figure this out. All that being said, do you know who the best defensive team in the NBA is in the last five games? That would be the Oklahoma City Thunder. They can clamp down. If they can figure out how to get this done on defense, I feel like they can get enough time or buy themselves enough time on offense to get the rest done. But they've got an offense that looks a lot like the Scott Brooks offense, which is if I don't have the ball, I'm going to just stand around. And Billy Donovan got to be the one to figure that out, whether you like it or not. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. On the line with us, doing us a solid from O'Hare International Airport on a layover. His name is Sal Palantonio. Now, Sal, you were in L.A. over the weekend with the Eagles. The Carson Wentz injury, is this one of those where they knew immediately what had happened? Well, I think Carson Wentz knew. Uh, I was watching him from a, a wing of the press box in my binoculars. When he got hurt, he immediately grabbed his left leg, and uh, he couldn't move. So I think Wentz knew. He stayed in there through the touchdown pass, and then he couldn't even jog off the field. They put him in the tent right away and and determined that his ACL was loose, and he walked off. Uh, and I talked to Zach Ertz, who didn't play in the game because he had the concussion for co- protocol. Ertz is one of his best friends on the team. They pray together in a church in Cherry Hill. And Ertz went into the locker room. It was just him and Carson Wentz. And I talked to Ertz afterwards, and Ertz said he was devastated right from the beginning, knew it was bad, um, and, you know, knew that he had a long fight back from a, from, a, from a rehab, from a surgery and rehab. Now, what was the mood around the team? Because I guess this would be the ultimate definition of a bittersweet victory, probably the biggest win they've had all year, and your quarterback gets hurt. Yep, bittersweet's a good way to put it. It's exactly how Vinnie Curry put it, Trey Burton, another close friend of his. They all talked about how bittersweet it is, but, you know, a lot of them also realize that they're in the playoffs and they've got to find a way. And that Nick Foles has played at a high level before, has done it for the Philadelphia Eagles, so he knows what to expect. He's played in this offense. And you got to remember, Bomani, you've got some players on this team that are very hungry to win a championship. And 11 and 2 doesn't come around. Very often. I'm talking about guys like Malcolm Jenkins and Fletcher Cox and Michael Kendricks. And that defense yesterday played very, very well. They held the Rams to 45 plays. And they got some players on that team who won Super Bowls before, LeGarrette Blunt and Chris Long, who made that strip sack of Jared Goff in the fourth quarter that uh, turned the final corner for the Eagles. So they got some players who know how to win and some players who want to win, and they're not going to hang their heads. They're, they're, they're going to move forward and find a way to get this thing done. And I think they can. I, I think they can still get to the NFC Championship game. If you look at their schedule <clears throat> coming up, Nick Foles traveling to the Giants. The Giants, you know, they couldn't move the ball a lick against the Cowboys at home last week. Eagles defense is much, much better than the Cowboys in every respect. That's a game that the Eagles defense can dominate. 
Christmas night at home against the Raiders. Uh, I'm putting a couple of shekels on the birds in that game. And then the Dallas Cowboys come in. You don't know what they're playing for. They'll have Elliott back, but who knows what they'll be playing for. So the Eagles could very easily run the table, which they control their own destiny. They win out. They, they secure home field. They get a week off. And then we'll recalibrate the situation. All right, we're talking to Sal Palatonio of ESPN here on the right time. Now, we've seen Nick Foles be like maybe the greatest quarterback we'd ever seen for that two month stretch in 2013. He kind of fell yep. to earth after that, but how much of a drop is there going from Wentz to Foles? Well, there's one specific difference, right? Wentz can make plays outside the structure of the called play. You know, he can extend the down. Foles is not going to do that. He, he's never had a history of that. He has a problem with the rush. We all know that. So they're going to have to figure out how to make things a little easier for him in protection, get the ball out of his hands a little bit more quickly. What worked for Foles was more of a hurry-up offense, quick strike. You know, get to the line of scrimmage as quickly as possible and get the playoff and then the defense can't make substitutions on a down-by-down basis because you're not making substitutions offensively. And you can dictate formation and defensive personnel through tempo. If you can do that, if you can dictate through tempo, you can keep the rush at bay, Bomani. And that's what's worked for him. But if you got the rush coming and he's in five- and seven-step drops, He's not going to be able to elude the rush like Carson Wentz. Let's face it. And now, Doug Peterson yesterday went through the list of guys that they've lost this year and why this was just another guy to replace and why they felt comfortable about it. But you would think <laughs> at some point, as he's reading the list, I would think he would be like, damn, that's a lot of people. You want to go through the list? Here we go. Sproles, Jason Peters. We're only talking about Darren Sproles, who's a Hall of Fame caliber running back, and Jason Peters, who's going to the Hall of Fame as a starting left tackle. Then you add the guy with the green sticker on the back of his helmet, Jordan Hicks, the middle linebacker. He's gone. Then in the middle of the course of the game, you lose your starting left guard in Wisniewski. He's gone. And then now you lose your starting quarterback, a guy on the MVP track. And you're 11-2 and in the first team to clinch a division title in the conference. So, yeah, they have that mentality. That's why I said to you before in my first – you know, first couple of seconds on your show. And by the way, thank you for having me on the show. I appreciate it. No problem, it. man. <laughs> uh, at, the, at the very outset, I tried, you know, I know the locker room well. I covered the team for 25 years. This is the best locker room for this team that I've ever seen. They got some veteran talent on this team. Some guys who, they got some gotta wanna guys. I'm not even mentioning Jay Ajayi. Jay Ajayi is bringing some attitude to this team and getting some extra yardage through some really good running. But I tell you, the two guys that totally impressed me the most on this team right now, Oligara Blunt and Chris Long, the two guys coming from New England. I mean, they have brought a winning attitude, uh, let's get it done attitude, uh, Bill Belichick, the contingency plan is already in the folder. Just pull it out attitude. We'll get it We'll get it done attitude. They're bringing that attitude, and that's a breath of fresh air on this team. All right, we're talking to Sal Palantonio of ESPN here on the right time. Now, you mentioned that defense. We know they've been good this year, but is this good enough to carry you to a championship? Because prior to this, we saw them as being very good and as part of a balanced team. Now we're asking them in a lot of ways to carry them. Well, don't agree necessarily completely with that statement. They were third in the league. They led the league in quarterback hits coming into the game, and they lead the league in quarterback hits coming out of the game. They're number one in the league in passing yards surrendered, fewest pass surrendered outside the numbers. So you can't throw it deep on them. They got a lot of, I'll grant you, they got a lot of guys playing right over their head, way ahead of their skis right now. And Patrick Robinson, Jalen Mills, Rodney McLeod, guys like that, Michael Kendricks. But I think that's because of the way they're getting coached up. I think Jim, Sh- I'm just going to say it. And if Eagles fans are listening, you know, so be it. I think Jim Schwartz, the defensive coordinator, is the MVP of the team. 
I mean, Bomani, the Rams were co-leaders in points scored going into yesterday, 30 points a game. They ran 45 plays yesterday. 45. The Eagles ran 85. That's sick. You take, away that... the, you take away the block punt and the short field in the first quarter due to that interception, the Rams are not in the game. By the way, you had to see that scene yesterday, man. I know you've been out in L.A. a lot, and you know the whole scene out there. It's not much of a football scene, but Philly fans, it was like an invading army of green. I never seen anything like it. It came from everywhere. I it came from everywhere. I could not believe they jumped in the crowd like that and there was no fear of safety. There was just one Rams fan, and then it was just the Eagles. I'm telling you, it was like an army of green, an Eagles army nation descended on that place. You you couldn't find a Rams fan most of the time. You couldn't right. find him. Hey, man, maybe the casting call. That is Sal Paulo Antonio. Check him out. Cover the NFL for us here at ESPN. But, man, get home soon. All right, bro. All right, now. You just call me, bro. All right. Thanks for listening to the Right Time Podcast. Please come back tomorrow for more. And don't forget to listen to The Right Time with Bomani Jones from 4 p.m. to 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app.